Welcome to the program on data and governance. This is distinguished lecture on big data law and policy. My name is Dennis Hirsch, and I am the faculty director of the program on data and governance, which we call PDG. PDG is a program of the Moritz College of Law and of the Translational Data Analytics Institute at The Ohio State University. Um, the program focuses on the governance of advanced analytics and AI. Now, as many people know, advanced analytics and AI can benefit us and our society in many ways. But AI can also produce privacy invasions, bias, manipulation, opacity, and other harms. An AI that does not honestly face and address these potential harms is not truly beneficial. And so the question becomes how to recognize and reduce AI's potential harms, how to ensure that AI is ethical and just. And that is a question of governance. And it is the question on which the program on data and governance focuses. PDG conducts research in this area. It also seeks to identify the leading thinkers on the topic and give them a forum to share their ideas with you, the PDG community. And today, we are delighted to have two such leading thinkers on the topic of AI ethics, Deirdre Mulligan and Nula O'Connor. Deirdre Mulligan, today's distinguished lecturer, is a professor in the School of Information at UC Berkeley, a faculty director of the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology, and a co-organizer of the Algorithmic Fairness and Opacity Working Group. Her research explores both the legal and the technical means of protecting values such as privacy, freedom of expression, and fairness in emerging technical systems. She is co-author of Privacy on the Ground, Driving Corporate Behavior, Driving Corporate Behavior in the United States and Europe, a book that has already become a classic in the study of, privacy of the privacy practices of large organizations. And it's a foundational work for other scholars such as myself interested in studying this topic. So it's a true pleasure to welcome Deirdre, a scholar whose work I so admire as our distinguished lecturer today. In addition to our distinguished lecturer, we also have a distinguished commentator Nula O'Connor. I will introduce her a bit later in the program. PDG could not put on these events without the contributions of others, and we especially appreciate the many ways in which the Moritz College of Law and the Translational Data Analytics Institute, or TDAI, at The Ohio State University support our work. And we also appreciate the work of Jillian Thompson, our program assistant and webinar maestro who did so much to organize this event and is running it right now behind the scenes. And now, without further ado, I give you Professor Deirdre Mulligan. Uh, thank you so much for that generous introduction, Dennis, and for giving me the opportunity to share this work today. Um, Gillian, thank you so much for a really excellent uh, down to the minute e explanation of all of our work today and for being such a terrific organizer. Um, and thank you so much for Nula uh, for agreeing to come and comment on this work. I couldn't think of anybody better. Um, so with that, I am going to start my screen share here. So walking the walk on AI ethics, aligning tech companies, AI ethics commitment with civil and human rights ideals. Um, obviously this talk is gonna to bring together ideas about governance, ideas about uh, the work that's happening um, inside companies. And where I really wanna start though, is this question of kind of like, what is AI ethics? Um, I wanna say we're kind of, experiencing what we could think about as the emergence of a new field, right? And when a field is emerging, 
um, the kind of social order is being constructed, right, through a process of strategic interactions among actors who are both vying for advantageous positions, but also collaborating and trying to articulate what it is the work um, that this emerging field is going to be doing. And when we think about the emerging field of AI ethics, particularly coming um, in the corporate setting, there's lots of other areas within the firm that are also potentially um, touching on, crossing over, intermingled with, um, enmeshed with this new and emerging field. So um, scholars have been looking at this field, right? And, and we see the language, right, shaping up. Is it ethical? Is it responsible? Is it ethically aligned? You know, what is the term that we want to use? And we've had quite a few scholars who've been looking at uh, the emergence of this new field from the top, right? There's been kind of a sea of scholars who've been looking at principles. And Floridian Cows, for example, um, studied five of the highest set of ethical principles for AI. Um, and they identified some core principles, right? And if we're thinking about like the what of AI ethics, right? We could be concerned about both the what and the how. And they identified beneficence, non-malfeasance, autonomy, justice, explicability, um, similar lines of work, exploring broader ranges of principles. So 84 principles, guidelines, and reports, or 36 prominent AI principles. Again, we see kind of some convergence around concepts around transparency and privacy, transparency, malfeasance, fairness. Um, but also, I think really importantly, in the Jobin et al. study, we see some substantive divergence around interpretation, right? What do these terms really mean? Justification, what's the purpose for choosing them? Or why do we think they're important? Who's responsible for enacting commitments? Um, and implementation, what does it actually mean to bring these things into practice? There's also been some really uh, excellent scholarship exploring the politics of these principles, right? Um, when we think about these principles documents, they're not mere kind of words on a page, right? They are trying to shape a field. They're trying to articulate an agenda, not just within the firm, but outside the firm, or not with, with it, within a company, a country, but kind of more globally. And um, Green, Stark, and Hoffman, in looking at these principles, they said, generally, they tend to position engineering and design as solutions to the problems technology has wrought. Uh, they tend to view kind of ethical problems as universal and similar across all countries, across all cultures, across time. Um, and interesting, barring language and methods from science and technology studies, which I assume many of the academics at least are familiar with, but a, a body of work, a field that really is interested in kind of um, technology itself as a site of ethical inquiry and as kind of an ethical actor in the world, um, but hollowed out and reconfigured in a way that makes it more tenable and palatable as business ethics. We also have other scholars who've been looking at the politics of these principles in ways that I think um, as lawyers we're very comfortable with this idea that they're being strategically used to limit regulation um, or that there is some ethics washing or ethics shopping or ethics shirking going on. So these are kind of the views from the top. Um, as Dennis mentioned, um, you know, one of the big areas of scholarly inquiry for me has been looking not just at the words on the page or the decisions that come down from um, courts, but looking at how those things shape the, uh, the enactment of values on the ground and particularly privacy in my uh, book, Privacy on the Ground. And here too, I take a similar approach, right? And I'm interested not just in what folks are saying, but how those things are kind of being articulated, um, understood and implemented and how they're shaping practices. I'm not the only one who's interested in this. Um, uh, Dennis himself has been very busy looking at uh, how data ethics is being understood in the corporate setting. Um, and he's found uh, you know, that data ethics means assessing the legitimacy and acceptability of advanced analytics projects um, in a kind of similar body of work. Uh, Jake Metcalf and colleagues have been uh, talking to ethics owners and uh, have identified their kind of core work as translating external norms and pressures into corporate lingo. 
in a, a way that they call everyday ethics. One of the things that's interesting about this is that um, none of this work seems to hinge on kind of a clear articulation of those policy statements, those principal statements into operational guidelines in practice, that it tends to be much fuzzier. Um, and some really interesting qualitative work talking with AI practitioners or in all found that um, the practitioners believe that responsibility for AI systems should be distributed across a range of actors, right? That they, the designers themselves are not kind of singly um, the source of responsibility. So my work right now, I'm looking at how sectors and firms within them are conceptualizing and implementing ethics. How do they give terms meaning? How do they justify those interpretations? How do they put them into practice? Um, how are they constructing expertise, right? Who's responsible for this work? Who owns it? Um, how are they distributing responsibility, both within firms and within, among firms and their clients, firms and regulators? Um, and, to, and how external and internal factors, including things like law, but also social movements and other forms of external pressure, um, internal factors such as other existing corporate structures or um, seats of knowledge and values work, um, shape those choices. So this AI ethics on the ground project um, is collaborative work. And at the same time that we're looking at how industry and different sectors within um, the business world are conceptualizing and operationalizing AI work, we're also engaged in a parallel stream of work looking at how academic efforts, particularly those that are designed to address data science and AI ethics work as part of a technical curriculum are being articulated. What are the canonical works? What are the teaching methods? What are the topics that people think need to be covered? Um, and so the sectors that I've been looking at, I'm leading the examination of AI on the ground in the corporate world. Um, I started with law and I have some work on that and I'll share some pointers at the end. Um, right now, I'm looking at um, the application and service layer infrastructure of data science. And what do I mean by that? Um, so we have companies that are providing kind of machine learning or data analytics as a service. And those firms um, have a very large footprint in this area, both because of the number of folks who are customers of theirs and who's the, so their technology is actually kind of affecting a much larger ecosystem um, around the way in which we're experiencing AI and data science in daily life. Um, they also happen to be firms that are highly engaged in the public conversation. They're engaged in helping to frame it. They're engaged in policy work around this and they're heavily engaged in both their own research around AI ethics, responsible AI, fairness in machine learning, et cetera. Um, and also very active in funding. So um, we sought initially to look at Google, Microsoft, and Salesforce for this particular project, um, which involves uh, uh, an examination of a corpus of documents, um, but actually had to rule out Amazon because there's such a dearth of material available in the public sphere about what they're doing, which I think is in and of itself interesting. So I'm going to talk about um, this document analysis project that we are doing right now. Um, but I don't want anybody to walk away thinking that I believe that one can merely look at text and understand what's happening within a company. Um, I think that would be uh, shoddy science. <laughs> um, but I do think that analyzing the kind of discursive practices in documents that are being used to shape the field is a really important site of inquiry. Um, we're coupling this analysis with examinations of the tools that, and tooling that people are producing, um, and of course, uh, doing qualitative interviews and other work to try to understand what's happening inside firms. So I'm going to be talking about uh, our work evaluating publicly available AI ethics documentation from these three firms. Um, they are producing a wide range of documents related to AI ethics, including guidelines, blog posts, educational modules, product documentation, and tooling for operationalizing ethics-related values. Um, this goes far beyond the principles, right? And I'll, I'll give you some visuals to see how just kind of the breadth of documents. Um, and I approach these documents in kind of the tradition of critical discourse analysis. I'm not looking at 
the words, like what terms are they using alone? I'm using these documents as a way to understand how they're defining and arranging the work of ethics, right? As I said earlier, how do they give terms meaning? How do they justify the choices they're making? How are they putting things into practice? How are they owning and allocating responsibility? Um, so how are they really translating those principles that they're, ta they're talking about into a walk, right, within the firm? And we can look at these documents the way we think of like as a script, right? And they're a script for ethical action. They're allocating work and responsibility to internal and external actors. They're constructing knowledge and expertise um, for AI ethics work. And in doing so, um, because these documents are not internally facing, right? These are externally facing. They're trying to help articulate a vision for this field, not just a vision for their own siloed work. Okay, I'm also, of course, interested um, in how these ethics documents relate to law, right? Uh, legal frameworks, other values within the firm, and compliance. Um, looking both, how does law inform AI ethics work, right? Does it inform the language that's being used? Is it, is it used to give meaning to terms? Does it justify understandings and interpretations of what it means to be ethical? Um, is it guiding the translation of principles into practice? Is this really kind of an activity in legal translation? Um, is it informing the distribution of responsibility, right? Do we have like ideas of secondary liability? Can we see those kind of influencing the ways in which firms are articulating the work? Equally importantly, from my perspective, is that I'm really interested in how this work may come to inform the law, right? Law is not something that exists um, in some top-down way that right, organizations through their interpretation work, through the processes they adopt, the methods they choose, the structures they put in place, um, kind of bleed back into uh, court and regulators' understandings of what it means to behave ethically. Um, and so I'm interested in kind of this two-part conversation. Okay. So when we think about law, like what areas of law might be interesting, and I just want to kind of say, like, if we think about what's driving this AI ethics conversation, there's been issues of racial bias, and I'm just going to kind of quickly go through these, right, issues of gender bias, questions about systemic oppression, discrimination and harassment, um, very like pointed issues about discrimination through algorithms or enabled by algorithms. Lawsuits have been filed. Also questions about human rights, right? Um, and I think very pointedly, um, the, the human rights language has been uh, very sharp and present in critiques coming from Google, Microsoft, Salesforce, and Amazon employees not just from the outside world. So if we think about kind of the areas of law that might be adjacent um, and both informing as well as informed by this ethical AI movement, um, I think it's important to think about privacy, safety, consumer protection, but I would suggest that the kind of um, environment in which these are emerging uh, really foregrounds their connection and potential kind of interrelatedness with human rights and equal protection laws. So for that reason, one of the particular uh, things that we're looking at right now is how do AI ethics documents configure diversity and inclusion? So why focus on diversity and inclusion? Well, first, many of the ethical challenges posed by data science and AI revolve around kind of general problems of bias and discrimination, as I just uh, walked through, very particular kinds of allocative and representational harm and exclusionary harms. Um, a wide range of the proposed solution to these problems have been advanced at the institutional and technical level under the labels of diversity or inclusion, right? We hear, well, the products are not reflecting all of the public that needs them or all of the public on whom they're going to be used. And it's because we need a more diverse workforce, for example. Um, in addition, diversity and inclusion have not been identified as core principles in the analysis of AI ethics principles that have been done. Yet the statements, if we look at the broader corpus of documents that these companies are producing, diversity and inclusion are quite prevalent. Um, 
And this isn't particularly surprising given the centrality of diversity and inclusion as solutions or as part of the solution in um, the field of uh, equal protection, non-discrimination, right, within corporate work. And so it's somewhat interesting that diversity and inclusion are not present at the principal level and have received relatively little scrutiny. Um, and then finally, diversity and inclusion discourse has been identified as a site of contestation, both within data ethics and related discussions, right? So Ruha Benjamin has flagged diversity and inclusion as a kind of happy talk, right? It acknowledges cultural difference without challenging structural inequalities. Um, and similarly, in law um, and organizational scholarship, um, uh, Lori Edelman has basically said that the rhetorical transformation from civil rights to diversity replaced a public commitment to minority hiring, and in particular, to the hiring of Black Americans with a commitment to diversity, a construct that's almost universally accepted as valuable and yet does little to promote race and gender equality in the workplace. So these terms are incredibly important and, and potent and very contested. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about our work looking at diversity, inclusion, and AI ethics documents. Um, I'm happy to talk about methodology, but I'll just very briefly. Um, we collected initially a set of documents um, broadly around AI ethics using um, queries in Google search, happy to talk about what those are. We then engaged in some purpose of sampling, basically looking to see the documents to which they relate and connect. Um, for this particular project, looking at diversity inclusion, we then filtered out um, a sample of documents. There's 46 of them that reference diversity, equity, and inclusion, including references to civil rights law, protected categories, and civil rights themselves, just to give you a, a quick overview. Um, and I just want to show like there's a lot of documents. And one of the things that we did was to try to look at where these documents rest or what, and what sort of work they're trying to do. And you'll note that there are principles documents there are pedagogical tools, there are product documentation, there are documents that are coming out of law and policy, there are general comms documents. You'll also see that Google's document tree and Microsoft's document tree don't look exactly the same, right? That there's a lot of variety in these things. Um, and when we get to Salesforce, even more with, you, you'll see kind of a real emphasis on pedagogical tools, for example, here, okay. So what do we see when we look at these documents um, and with a focus on these terms of diversity inclusion? How are they being used? What are they being used to do? What's the justification for their use? One of the interesting findings initially is that normally when we talk about diversity and inclusion, it, there's a third word that travels with it, right? We talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And in our work, we found that diversity um, and inclusion are prevalent, but equity really is notably absent from the corpus of documents. So this standard triad in corporate management, um, you know, the three friends no longer work together. And equity appears relatively um, infrequently and separately from diversity and inclusion. And where we might expect to see the word equity in a read, like where it would be a normal place for it, we often see um, a substitution, the word fairness. And equity is certainly a form of fairness. However, fairness can take other forms, right? Procedural regularity or equal treatment or other things. Um, and diversity and inclusion are very frequently put in service of fairness. So, you know, just to give you an example from one of the documents, right, to see that you see equitable in here, but fairness um, is a, a much more kind of widely used term. Another uh, dominant theme in the document is this pattern of owning expertise and allocating responsibility. So the documents, within the documents, companies are positioning themselves as experts on approaches to ethics. There's just an abundance of pedagogical tools. You would think that industry has become kind of the leading educator in this space in some ways. Um, and I think there may be some truth to that. Um, 
responsibility though for ethics is generally allocated to customers. We're going to educate you, we're gonna provide you with tooling, but you have to actually figure out what ethics means on the ground. Um, and finally, uh, as um, Green and then Stark and Hoffman noted, um, engineers and designers are identified as the people who can solve ethical problems, right? This is work of engineers. So just to give you a few examples, um, you know, here we see these pedagogical tools where the companies are kind of positioning themselves as experts about how to understand to define how to define bias and fairness, how to build a diverse team, how to translate your company values, how to describe the importance, right? And this is kind of like very common sorts of work that we see these documents doing. Customer responsibility, right? Again, lots of kind of questioning and answering, telling the, com the customers who are using the company's tools, what questions they should be asking, what approaches they might be taking, but really putting the ball in their court. Um, and diversity inclusion work is really placed within engineering and design workflows. So there's an emphasis on technical work such as data and model construction and user testing, um, some on managerial approaches within technical practice. So for example, you need a diverse technical team. Um, and diversity and inclusion are often framed not as important because they are necessary to address systematic or historic experiences of oppression or to remedy particular wrongs, but rather because they're going to give you a better product, right? Your product will be more inclusive. It will be more profitable. It will be, et cetera. Um, and in addition, we see kind of the repurposing and augmentation of general design and engineering methods as a means of providing protection. So a real emphasis on these technical solutions. So technical mechanisms for modeling the construct of fairness, methods and tools for exploring biases and inputs and outputs. And just to give you some of the kind of taste of what those are, you know, there are fair learn tools. There are what if tools, right, that allow you to explore biases in your data set. And what if you use different metrics for thinking about operationalizing fairness? Um, auto ML, right, the ability to produce meaningful and contextually relevant ML systems, right? It allows you to train your model differently and to test it. Different fairness um, indicators, right, that allow you, again, to use different ways to kind of model and think about fairness within your data set and, and your use of an algorithm. Um, and things like this, the Einstein discovery, right, bias protection, predictions, um, models with protected fields, gaining deeper insight, right, so very, very focused on the ways in which we can build ethics into the technical pipeline. Um, yeah, and things like model cards, which are a little bit more about kind of design work, not so much engineering work, but they're kind of the bridge between design and engineering. In addition, um, we also see this emphasis on technical solutions leading to different things being diverse, right? When we think about diversity and equity and inclusion um, in law or in management, right, often we are talking about uh, initially, right, if we're thinking about civil rights law, we're concerned with particular protected classes. Um, if we're thinking about diversity as it's been brought into management rhetoric, it may be a broader range of attributes, right? We might not just be concerned about making sure that we are respecting diversity and creating an inclusive environment for people of different backgrounds and races and genders, but we might also be concerned about political opinions and educational experiences, et cetera. In this corpus of documents, diversity is not so much attached to people who are within the firm, right? Talking about diversifying our workforce or diversifying the pipeline of people who might be coming into it, but diversity is used to modify data sets. It's used to modify test users. It's used to modify use cases. And to give you some examples of that, right? Um, you need to have, you know, we test models with diverse data sets. Um, we need to develop diverse teams, right? These are the sorts of ways in which diversity is being used. Okay. 
so this really leads to kind of the shift is what to, of what is being diversified or made inclusive. The subjects of diversity inclusion include these non-human artifacts, right? Data sets, use cases. Um, there's a shift to traits that are more amenable to technical forms of observation. So for example, things such as skin tone are substituted for conversations about classifications such as race or ethnicity, et cetera. And protected attributes become replaced by sensitive categories, things that might be sensitive to use. Um, and so uh, we see kind of a, both a, what I would say is some kind of attenuation and drift in, in what the meaning of these terms are. Now, these, this um, attenuation and drift is really important, right? It, it makes these concepts legible to technical practitioners and therefore it allows diversity and inclusion to be built into an engineering process, to be built into a design process. Um, but it's really interesting to look at the ways in which diversity and inclusion are being reconfigured, right? So I wanna start by saying, I think the AI ethics documents resonate with some of the attenuation and drift away from civil rights that was found in corporate diversity, equity and inclusion work um, by scholars such as Lori Edelman and, and others. Um, but it goes even further in that it's really charting new ways of enacting diversity and inclusion work um, as it applies these terms to technical artifacts. And I think we see really a waning connection to equity and therefore kind of a kind of further kind of dissipation of the work that civil rights and human rights um, have historically done in kind of thinking about concepts of diversity and inclusion. So this attenuation and drift, right? Um, one, when we think about diversity and inclusion, we would normally be thinking about employees and management and board members and maybe the workforce. And now we see it being used to modify data sets and use cases and testers. On the one hand, right, um, this is really important to address and advance equitable outcomes in AI systems. On the other hand, right, users can enact these forms of diversity and inclusion, producing better products or improving market access without addressing the distinct disadvantages of minoritized groups. Um, you know, we can produce a, a biased, we can reduce the production of biased data sets, but not necessarily um, address the underlying practices that led to the biases they include to begin with. Um, we can create inclusivity in our products without actually addressing exclusion or oppression within our workplaces. This move away from equity, I think, is fascinating. Um, instead of equity, we have many forms of diversity and inclusion that can serve many different contextually relevant definitions of fairness and fairness being, act, being enacted in the design of the product itself. Um, now, this move to fairness, I think, is important, right, and resonates uh, with the fact that while um, many of the harms that have given rise to the kind of AI ethics conversation are about exclusion, misrepresentation of um, people with particular protected attributes, you know, kind of in that civil rights, human rights framework, there are other areas such as content moderation, for example, right, where we might have other ideas about what fairness requires, right? It's not necessarily just about kind of protection um, of particular rights, right? And so I think that there's some important need to um, broaden the connection, what diversity and inclusion can be connected to. Um, however, I think that this raises some important questions as well. Um, it can invite some kind of like context sensitive application on the one hand, right? Allowing you to both use diversity and inclusion in thinking about content moderation or thinking about harassment or thinking about an allocation algorithm. 
But on the other hand, I think it can invite some kind of moral relativism, right? The idea that all these forms of fairness are, are equal. Um, and, you know, there's, there's, this is a little quote from Google's playing with AI fairness that represents all the definitions of fairness, I think, as being kind of equally valid, right? It says, as the morning breaks, the five experts are still collegially arguing which sense of fairness is the fairest in the land. There is no right answer. And I would suggest, I mean, in different applications, there might actually be a right answer, right? And um, I think uh, this is um, important to think about. The conceptual ambiguity, right, and kind of dealing with the fact that one size fits all fairness is not the right outcome um, can allow for this context sensitive specification of ethical requirements. But it also, as um, Middlestat notes, can mask fundamental principle disagreement, right? And kind of drive this level of kind of moral relativism that I think is, is frightening. Um, this shoring up of expertise and distributing responsibility. So these documents, the firms are really positioning themselves as experts on approaches and techniques for solving the problem of AI ethics. Um, the documents, there's an enormous use of a questioning format and like a, a kind of classic Socratic um, style of discourse. Um, at the end of the day, responsibility is always allocated to the customers, to the clients. And I, Metcalf, Moss and Boyd um, talk about the connection between meritocracy and the tech field and the way in which that's shaping AI ethics work. And they talk about this kind of emphasis, well, you know, we hire really good engineers, right? They're really good people working in all of these companies, trying to do the right things. And that like, this is the kind of mantra that you'll get out of um, the companies. And, and they, you know, interviewed a much broader range of companies. But I think this idea that the way in which we're going to address AI ethics is by um, hiring people with a good, strong ethical compass and you as um, our customers should do the same, does continue to be present in this, di that in this idea that engineers are kind of going to be capable of addressing the ethical work in their workflows with very little engagement, right? When you read these documents, it doesn't say go talk to your lawyers or talk to your UX people or, right? Like it, it tends to be very focused on kind of how engineers can make these problems tractable and attend to them in their own work. So we can think about the ways in which these are kind of circling the bandwagon around the particular kinds of technical expertise that's central to AI ethics work. You know, I'm sure you're all familiar with Evgeny Morozov's work on techno-solutionism. And I think we could view these as kind of defining and closing down the solution space, right? If, if engineering is the answer, well, then why do we need law? Um, setting up this idea that social problems can be addressed through technical innovation, right? We can just build our way out of this problem. Um, and this idea, you know, we see kind of um, an emphasis on ethics generally and much more limited use of rights. Um, I will say these corporate documents do talk about human rights at times and they will reference civil rights at times but they tend to be much, uh, you know, much more infrequent than kind of resort to different sorts of ethical principle language. Um, and finally, the, the ways in which the expertise is turned to put to use is around optimizing products and client outcomes, right? And so the client, the customer who's picking up these tools is gonna be defining what the goals of diversity and inclusion are it's not framed as preventing and remedying specific harms. There's like not the kind of clarity of direction that you might get from a lawyer, for example, about what things you ought to avoid and not a ton of language around harms. Um, now, obviously some of this reconfiguration is certainly necessarily necessary and I think potentially beneficial, right? It enables technical work to contribute to products and services that yield more equitable and fairer outcomes. Um, and it brings technical practitioners to the table, I think in two distinct ways. Um, first, kind of the abstraction, formalization and kind of mechanization of some of these important terms 
um, make it part of technical practice, right? And so this framing may encourage engineers to view ethics, at least as in part legitimate, potentially even mandatory aspect of their practice. Um, similarly, emphasis on design processes as legitimate sites of diversity and inclusion, I think creates space for UX and other design professionals who are often, right, human-centered, stakeholder-oriented, um, to engage in values work, right? It can legitimate that the sorts of questions that they want to bring into the room are appropriate to ask. Um, and I think it's really necessary if we want to think about ethics in design, right? Some of this instrumentalization and abstraction um, is really important. Um, it also, I think, might be useful in legitimating activities beyond compliance, right? That um, we can view the kind of like decoupling from law as problematic, right? And that it might not be viewed as in service of legal ideals, in service of addressing historic injustice. On the other hand, it may also allow people to run a little bit further, right? To push beyond compliance, to not have kind of the law be the limit on what corporations might imagine and do in the, um, uh, under the banner of ethics, right? And it might, might allow for a different kind of vision of the relationship between legal compliance and justice. Um, I think it's inviting in some new kinds of professionals, right, that this is not just about lawyers, it's not just about privacy leads, it is certainly about kind of the ethical engineer. Um, and I think it may be asserting um, a boundary between law compliance and ethical AI saying that there is some breathing room be between what we might think is the responsible thing to do, the ethical thing to do, and what the law might require of us, and that we might want to hold ourselves to some different sort of standard. There's also some risk. Um, Metcalf and Moss say, you know, doing ethics may become a performance of procedure rather than an enactment of responsible values. And I think this goes back to what Middlestead said about kind of this moral relativism. Well, as long as we we built to some kind of fairness, you know, that's enough. Um, I think there's some really important attention that we need to pay as the line between legally salient, culturally significant breakdowns, right? Um, and other forms of kind of technical errors, right? That those things are not the same and we, and we shouldn't view them as the same. And if we abstract and formalize them all, that may be the way they're read. The engineering logic um, really drives this client-centered orientation the same way for a lawyer, right? In, in practicing law, you have this client-centered orientation, which I think leads these firms in the position, not as ethics owners, but really in these documents, what we see them as is ethics educators and allocators. Let me tell you what's important and let me tell you what you need to do. Um, I think we also see this kind of resort to ethical pluralism. If we think about um, in the security literature, in the privacy literature, right, uh, this idea that um, what is ethical is going to be very contested and contestable. And as the engineer, I'm just going to give you the tools to build the thing. I'm not going to tell you exactly what to build towards. You have to pick out the vision of justice. There's this really important piece, which is I think in that shift to client centeredness, there is an emphasis on the unit of analysis, not being the algorithm or the data set, but being the socio-technical system. How are you gonna put this tool to work, right? What is the constant, sorry, what is the context in which it is going to be deployed? Organizational, societal, et cetera. And I think that's super important um, because I think it engages clients in a sort of values questioning, right? This idea that I can't tell you it's fair, there's going to be work required to figure that out. I can't tell you what kinds of diversity you need. You're going to have to do work in your context, situated where you are, who you are, the work you're trying to do to figure this out. That may um, operate in a, Katie Shelton's language is a values lever, right? Opening up room for conversations within client organizations. So when we look at these documents, kind of the level below principles, I think um, we see more emphasis on ethics as process and reflection rather than adherence to first principles. Um, and I think that this is important if we think about like what ethics is really about, like 
um, Ms. Seeger and, and Rodriguez talk about kind of the principles documents or law being kind of the end of ethics, right? Like after we've figured out what we need, we craft those. But the, a lot of the ethical work, right? What does it mean to do ethical work is to engage in that questioning, right? And to question the world and the lenses through which we see it consciously, constantly, and iteratively. And I think we can see some of the tenor of these documents kind of aimed in that direction. So I want to close. I know I'm a little over time, but I'm going to close quickly. What are some of the implications for law? Um, well, some depolitization as technical experts occupy the field, um, positioning as solvable by technical work rather than legal, political, or movement work. And I think it's super interesting to look at, unlike security by design or privacy by design, where design followed law and policy, we see engineering and to a lesser extent leading and, you know, if we want to contrast that with developments in privacy, remember privacy by design was identified as essential by regulators in the mid 90s, right? There was engineering work, like pretty good privacy in the mid 90s, not until um, the mid 2000s did we see real engineering work at places like the Internet Engineering Task Force. If we look at the scholarly literature, right, the privacy engineering as an academic discipline was really slow to take off. Um, we saw first academic workshops, right, 2014, 2015. There was some earlier work in HCI starting in 2004. Um, and we, I think if we look at the ways in which privacy by design has been adopted within organizations, we see you know, Ira Rubenstein found relatively few firms had, had addressed it in my own work with Ken Bamberger. We found it more common in German and US form, firms, but really underdeveloped and kind of driven by lawyers and compliance and audit, not kind of driven by engineers. Um, and really recent work found that 62% of the engineers that work for organizations um, that expect them to consider privacy mechanisms Another 38, you know, there's no clear or even negative norms associated with thinking about privacy. And I want to suggest that this corpus of ethics documents suggest a really different story, right? There's an abundance of tooling and instrumentalization, and engineers are clearly centered as kind of not just part of the puzzle for ethical AI, but as somehow uniquely able to fix it. And I have a whole other lecture about why I think this is happening, but I just want to say that like when we look at some of the kind of ways in which AI ethics has emerged, I think it's deeply tied to engineering, right? We've seen an explosion of AI ethics conferences that are kind of centering engineering and computer science and a really quick escalation in kind of the, the academic fields adoption of this thing. Um, and so when we think about kind of implications for law more broadly, um, I think we want to think about how all of this engineering work may come back to inform what human rights and equal protection require, right, on the back end. I think we need to be really mindful of the fact that these documents are defining the solution space as not law, as not business model, as not reform of right, that it's about building our way to a better future. And finally, I think we need to really think about connecting the communities, right. In privacy, we have this kind of more legal driven thing, technology slow to develop. I think we now have the opportunity with this engineering stuff, showing some real buy in to connect. And I think that that's like an important opportunity. Um, I think we need to resist some of this depolitization of historical contextual systemic situated harms and the narrowing of the solution space. Um, and there's a diverse set of resistors to this kind of techno solutionism or engineering, we can build our way out of this, which we can talk about. Um, and so I hope that this kind of uh, examination of this documents um, you view as useful, right? Because I think the inquiries into this production help us better engage with how the configurations of power that we see in the discourse in these documents um, has implications for fundamental rights and freedoms. And um, I think most importantly right now, I want to say that um, we see diversity and inclusion, right, which was transformed by managers and corporate uh, and corporate practices to align with business goals being broadened yet again to accommodate product teams and engineering logics and to suit technical workflows. 
And on the one hand, as I said, this is incredibly pragmatic, right? We need engineers at the table. On the other hand, these broadened definitions construct a world in which corporations can make progress on AI ethics without addressing diversity and inclusion issues in the workforce. As these companies continue to receive criticism on the managerial side for their low progress in diversity statistics across all employees, highly reported individual incidents such as the firing of leading AI ethics researchers Tim Nickabru and Meg Mitchell, they are still producing right these um, and promoting an increasing number of tools and publications aimed at engineering a diverse, fair, and inclusive society. And while I think these goals are important, I think we need to make sure that they're not decoupled, that diversity and inclusion do really important political work in the world. And as, a, as the field emerges, we need to make sure that by making these things uh, amenable to engineering practice, we don't defang them in the process. Thank you so much. Thank you, Deirdre, uh, for such an interesting and stimulating talk. Um, you've really given us, us a lot to think about. And now we're going to hear the thoughts of another expert in the field, our distinguished commentator, Nula O'Connor. Nula is currently the Senior Vice President and Chief Counsel for Digital Citizenship at Walmart. So she will really be able to give us an inside perspective into the types of dynamics that Deirdre was talking about. Before joining Walmart, uh, Nula served as the president and CEO of the Center for Democracy and Technology, a leading privacy uh, advocacy group. She also previously served as vice president of compliance and customer trust and associate general counsel for privacy and data protection at Amazon. Before that, she was chief privacy leader at General Electric and in the public sector, she served as the first chief privacy officer at the US Department of Homeland Security. So as you can tell from this brief bio, Nula is one of those rare thought leaders who brings private sector, public sector and public interest perspectives to bear on questions of data privacy and data ethics. And so she's very well suited to comment on today's lecture on AI ethics and civil rights. Before we turn to Nula, I want to just remind audience members to submit your questions through the Q&A function. We've received five questions thus far, but I'm sure there are more out there. So please submit them. I will assimilate them and present them to the speakers at the conclusion of Nula's remarks. And now uh, I give you Nula O'Connor. Thank you so much. Dennis, thank you so much to Jillian, and of course, most importantly to Professor Deirdre Mulligan. It is an honor and a delight to be here with all of you today, um, most especially because I've been so lucky that so many members of my team are here to hear from Professor Mulligan and to learn from her just as I am doing. And I also want to note that while Deirdre and I go a ways back, uh, I know her well enough to speak of her in the first name basis. Um, all of you don't. And so out of respect for her position and her work, I'm going to refer to her as Professor Mulligan in my brief uh, commentary. And so I've been asked to respond to this incredible corpus of work that Deirdre, uh, Professor Mulligan has taken on um, in these recent um, analyses. And my response is yes. In my career, I've learned to be brief. And really the, 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 my being humorous about that is really to say Deirdre has once again illuminated a path forward for practitioners just as she did uh, some years ago when she studied the use and the emergence of privacy on the ground in institutions around the world. And she weaves together the essential threads of technology innovation, civil liberties and human rights, and the societal impact of technology into a framework for thinking about institutional structures and actions and their impact on human beings. This path forward that she has articulated is going to help us transform the use of technologies 
and to advance human dignity in the digital world. And I want to note that the customers she was talking about in her remarks are really companies like Walmart and others. The customers that I think about every day are the human beings who shop in our stores and shop online. Um, but I want to reflect that Professor Mulligan time and time again has been a significant influence on the institutional and the private sector creation of practices uh, at companies around the world. Her work has also informed, as she kind of obliquely pointed out, not only the actions of companies, but then how those actions are translated into law and policy on a more omnibus basis. And I am sure, just as her work informed the passage of countless state data breach and privacy laws, it will inform the eventual passage of federal legislation in the United States. So any wise practitioner of data and technology ethics, values, implementation, compliance will take heed of Professor Mulligan's research and will strive to operationalize and implement these frameworks. So as I said, I'm here as much to learn and to reflect and to celebrate Professor Mulligan's work. Um, we, are, we are certainly not here to position ourselves as an expert and we are certainly the customer of these technologies um, but we are definitely striving for ex excellence, as we say at Walmart. And a question that Professor Mulligan touched on at the end that I think I want to share informs my work continually, not only at my previous role at the Center for Democracy and Technology, but here at Walmart, is the societal relevance and why the question Professor Mulligan posed is why now? Why is this moving so much faster and so differently, frankly, than privacy by design. Um, and that is, I think, because it is of the moment. And I think there is no more important work for all of us to do in our respective roles, whether the private sector, public sector, academia, civil society, is in this country, at least in the United States, addressing and eradicating structural inequalities and systemic racism. And so that mission Will, certainly informs my work in my leadership role at Walmart. I have just been asked to serve on the President's Inclusion Council at Walmart, which is senior leaders advising our CEO and working with our lead of diversity, equity, and inclusion on operationalizing those values. My role in that obviously is operationalizing those beliefs and those values in the technology and the data use for our company and our customers. I want to talk a little bit, of course, about what is digital citizenship, my role and the, the, the role of our amazing team, um, because it's a new construct and we get that question a lot inside and outside the company. And it responds to many of the themes that, Deirdre, uh, that Professor Mulligan articulated um, in her remarks. But most of all, I want to talk about kind of the birth story of this group and, and why I came to join it. The invitation was, come help us do the right thing with technology and data. Now those sound like general words and, and I, I do understand, but I'm also trying to be mindful of not engaging in corporate jargon or, you know, or, or fancy speak. We need to address these issues and make technology and data use and issues real and accessible to people around the world. Um, and so really before I even start to talk about what our mission is, I need to talk a little bit about the scale and scope of this amazing company where I now work. We have 2.3 million employees. We call them associates around the world. We have over 10,000 10, real world stores. We have 48 banners or brands around the world in 24 countries and e-commerce websites, of course. In the United States alone, 90% of the US population lives within 10 miles of a Walmart store. Over 200 million people shopped at a Walmart place of business in the last week. If that isn't staggering enough to kind of, you know, make you stand back and say the scope of, of these issues is significant, 
the impact on the human beings that we serve is unquestionable. And so when the invitation came to do the right thing with technology and data for that number of human beings and at that scale, it was really quite an awesome opportunity and responsibility. I came to Walmart at a time when there were already phenomenal technologists, compliance people, lawyers, experts in data protection and privacy in, frankly, in AI and ethics and um, the development of responsible technology. We have strived, we have striven over the last several months and, and years to knit this team together around the mission of the ethical use of data and the responsible use of technology. That is a fairly wide ambit. So I'm gonna say that again, the, the ethical use of data and the responsible use of technology. What we are asking this team to do and challenging them to do and propelling forward in is to take all of the disciplines that we already know and have thought about, the data protection, the privacy officers, the, um, the governance of technology, and to look at the holistic impact on the human being and make those judgments, the judgments that, that Professor Mulligan was referring to that companies were asking their customers to make about whether these things should be done. Not only the, can we do it because it's legal or how do we do it because we wanna be compliant with law, but the should we questions. I love that construct that my, I've learned from my own colleagues since joining the company that we are a little bit the should we team. We are also creating as I like to say, we are governing the ungovernable when it comes to AI and ML or governing the opaque and invisible technologies that power the consumer experience, the, the, the digital architecture and infrastructure of our company in the new world for our customers. Um, and we are, we are leaning, of course, on traditional structures of ethics and compliance and policy creation, leadership, training and education, collaboration and communication across the company, monitoring and auditing and detecting and correcting and all of the things you, you all compliance people know in the sentencing guidelines and applying those norms and those structures and operations to a new set of issues. You know, we already do compliance, hopefully very effectively in many physical world ways, but now we are looking at applying those programmatic values and structures to, again, seemingly opaque technologies in the digital world. These are awesome responsibilities. And we started, I sometimes joke, I've been here a year and I've written four sentences, but we started with what is our framework? I, I am proud to say that this is a company that has thought a great deal about its values and its place in the world and its societal responsibility. And it had classic, long-standing, well-known values within the company of service and respect and excellence and integrity. And we set about thinking about how those values could be articulated and embedded into technology development, into data use. And we wrote in concert with not only our communications team and people who do these things for a living, but the business owners and the technology teams, we wrote our digital trust commitments. If there's one slide I should have had, I should have had this one on the screen for you, but I will read it. And they are, our use of technology and data will be in service of people. We will strive for excellence in our use of technology, making it simple, convenient, and secure. We will use data responsibly and transparently and always with integrity. And the one I want to really focus on today is our data practices and technology will treat people fairly with dignity and respect. And I'm, I'm noting with great care, Professor Mulligan's comments about equity and fairness. And we use both of those as values at the company. Um, and my personal you know, favorite word, as everybody knows, is the word dignity. Because I do think at the fundamental uh, fundamental promise we make to the human beings who work for us and with us and, and in whose service we are is that we will treat all human beings with dignity. Um, and so let me just turn very quickly to describe our structure. The people who work on these issues at Walmart include lawyers, 
technologists, engineers, uh, compliance and policy experts. And most recently, um, we have been, we have added a number of people who have strong governance and auditing and operational expertise because we need to help embed these values across the company in ways that can be sustained, scaled, and also scrutinized. And I'm really, really pleased to say we've had just incredible, incredible talent in that area. We obviously partner closely with product development teams, with the global technology teams, with our communications and our compliance and our legal teams. Um, but most of all, we look at, are these the right things to do in the world? Are they not only fair, but also equitable? What is the impact on the human beings who are touched by these technologies? And how, and the biggest question, I think the hardest question for all of us who are operationalizing these technologies is how do we consistently scrutinize for equitable outcomes? I'm so pleased, and I'm, I'm happy to close on this because we're running out of time, that in this new org structure, and I, I also like to say, when everybody is responsible for something, nobody is. And so I would say this organization, this new up, uh, newly standard up uh, organization, digital citizenship, is responsible for these issues. And within that structure, we are announcing a new senior director of digital values who will be the lead operator and thinker and champion for equity and fairness. And you'll see both of those words in the job description within our team to really think about how we intersect human rights, civil liberties, equity, fairness, transparency with the evolution and the innovation that is happening at the company. And it is unquestionable to me, at least, that some of the highest focuses of this role will be racial and gender equity, transparency, and accountability for the company. So I am so delighted and honored again to reflect a little bit of the excellence that Professor Mulligan has called on all of us to walk forward in the digital world. And I look forward to continuing to learn from her and to partner with her in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Nula. Um, really interesting to hear your perspective on these issues and Walmart's perspective. Um, we've got received some really excellent questions from the audience. Uh, we've got about six minutes left before our 1.15 ending time. Um, and so let me pose some of the audience questions. Um, so, and these are both for Deirdre and for Nula. Um, a couple of the questions touch upon the distinction between equity and equality or equity and fairness, which each, each of you have talked about. Um, in your experience, do organizations tend to conflate them, uh, equality and equity and fairness? And one questioner, one audience member asks, equity does not equal fairness or equality. In the present use of the term equity or the present use of the term equity results in inequality because it results in applied bias for one of the more favorable groups. So how would you talk about the distinctions between fairness, equality, and equity in this context? I'm gonna let Nula go first because I'm interested in like, you know, as an academic, I have a lot of a lot of thoughts, but I want to hear like on the ground, how do you think about those? Well, first to acknowledge that the words do not mean the same thing. And I would say I'm personally on a learning journey and it's one that we've all experienced, I think, as a group um, where I work. We've been very, very lucky to engage, particularly in some racial equity training, learning um, and opportunities, and really thinking about how equity informs the work that we do and the technologies that we employ. Um, and I, I would agree with Professor Mulligan, with Deirdre, okay, I'm gonna switch to Deirdre, um, Deirdre's points that fairness can also mean totally different things. It has, it has totally different equities in the technology space entirely. Um, I hear implied in, in that question, some very difficult choices about who are we privileging and who are we not? And what are the values we're privileging? Um, and I would say, you know, the, the company 
that I work for has made it very clear that it recognizes in the United States, we are on a journey of writing historic wrongs and being really transparent about the choices that we are making as a company to support social equity and, and being transparent about that. So, you know, as the nation's, one of, as I think the nation's largest private sector employer, I, we have a responsibility to be as inclusive and embracing of every human being. And I think we are really doing some amazing and wonderful things. And I, I, I very much support our leadership's courage in that area. So I guess um, on the fairness issue, um, at, like when we think about the various kinds of biases that uh, folks raise concerns about um, algorithms, right? You can see them being raised, right? So, oh, you just introduced um, a new algorithm and it is flagging conservative speech more than liberal speech, right? Mm -hmm. And that, so, you might say, well, um, it's a it's a neutral algorithm, right? We're we're applying the same set of rules to the population's speech, no matter what your political position is. And somebody might say, yes, but you're having a biased outcome because more conservative speakers are being caught up and flagged, for example, as um, problematic. And somebody might say, well, that's not fair, right? And it could be because they say, well, you're algorithmic, you might be treating everybody the same, but because of the way in which you developed it, um, it is, uh, it's, it's kind of uh, creating a bunch of false positives for conservatives. Somebody might look at it and say, no, actually, what's going on is that conservative speakers are more likely to be engaged in problematic speech, right? And, and so I give this example, right, like just to say that when we're looking at the ways in which algorithms, data science, machine learning are being used in the world, um, equality and equity may not always do all the work, right? Like I don't, what's the right outcome, right? When we're thinking about like um, a, a fair moderation algorithm, right? People might use the term fair there to kind of hint at procedural needs, right? Like that you should be transparent about how I'm being judged. There should be recourse for me, right? Like fair in the due process kind of sense. So um, yes, right, equality and equity, right? Giving everyone the same or distributing um, based on needs and background conditions, et cetera. Very different understandings of what it means to be fair. But what I wanna say is in the work that algorithms are doing, um, kind of claims of bias and unfairness come up in all of these ways that are not actually about kind of protected traits, right? They're, they're coming up in other ways. Um, you know, is your uh, algorithm for surfacing my company treating me fairly, right? And, and so I think that the reason that the, part of the reason for using this language of fairness is it allows us to encompass both um, kind of the substantive rule as well as the procedural issues, but also because it allows us to think about all of the ways in which fairness might be constructed, right? Fairness in the courtroom. Are you fairly represented? Was the judge, did they have a financial interest? Like, like fairness means lots of different things depending upon the context. Thanks. Um, one more question. Uh, so we had a couple of questions from the audience dealing with kind of law and regulation. One audience member wants to know what's the role of regulation in ensuring equity and fairness. The other points to the fact that, you know, Deirdre, you talked a lot about technical solutions and technological solutions to some of these equity issues. Should the law select technologies to achieve equitable ends and, you know, essentially bake technology into law or if it does that, does it risk becoming out of date because technology evolves so much faster than law? How can law incorporate and promote technology without falling behind technology? Do you have any recommendations on that? Yeah. 
Um, so I think we, be, many of the concerns that are arising with respect to algorithms really are kind of concerns of the systemic effect, not just of the individual effect. And a lot of the ways in which we um, uh, think about kind of harm tends to be very individualized, right? And, and I do think that we need to think about different ways in the public sector, right? when we're using a system that embeds an algorithm to make decisions about a population, right? That we're um, using it as part of the, the governance process. Um, we need to actually understand that there are a whole host of values embedded in that system, right? And the, the uh, algorithm that, or the, the algorithmic system that tends to be held up most often, right? Is the compass, um, risk recidivism system, right? And there's, you know, what algorithm are we going to use? What is the data set? What are we going to be using as the variable to predict recidivism? Well, if we're going to use, right, re-arrest, well, that actually captures not just somebody recommitting a crime, but also policing practices, right? So it's going to be kind of compounded and tainted by particular systemat systematic um, over surveillance of certain populations. Like, and if we don't actually examine all of the embedded choice, and then like, how do we bin things? What are the thresholds? What are the cutoffs? Um, what are the incentives for the people relying on the system to defer to it or to challenge it, right? All of those things, those are policy decisions. And we have to understand um, that we can't just say, oh, we're gonna procure something to help us do our work we actually have to view that as a site of policy making. And so we need to think much more about transparency, not just during the kind of selection process, but also during use, right? The people who are using those systems need to understand the embedded values. And, you know, this is true, not just in like that particular example, but if we think about the ways in which algorithmic systems are being used in like clinical decision support, right? In the context of law, in the context of healthcare, et cetera, the people who are using those tools need to understand all the value choices that are embedded in them. And they need to be kind of continually exposed to them in use because otherwise we can't kind of continue to be responsible professionals, right? We're just gonna kind of be deferential to our tools and think of them as neutral. And these are not, these are not like a thermometer, right? They're not like, these are, these are things that are making predictions. They are, um, they're engaged in their own kind of learning. They don't see things the way we see them, et cetera. And so exposing the logic, understanding all of the assumptions behind the models, the data, et cetera, are just incredibly important. And it's true in the private and the public sector. Unfortunately, uh, we're out of time. I think we could probably, um, I would find it interesting to continue this discussion for quite a while longer, but, uh, but we do need to stop. Um, so thank you both Deirdre, Professor Mulligan, um, and uh, Nula for all of your insights and, and thoughts on this important topic. Uh, and thanks to each of you in our audience for joining us today. Please watch your email for future PDG events. We'll try to continue to bring in continue bringing you thought leaders like we've had today. So thanks everyone.